Welcome, everybody, to the SoCal Car Scene Podcast, the exclusive place for coverage of car culture in Southern California and the personalities that drive it. I'm your co-host, Big J Marash, and also the technical director and the producer of this program. Today, we are on overdrive today with our guest, the owner of Geez Up, Greg Ovis. But okay. first, this show is associated with SoCal Classic Car Storage. SoCal Classic Car Storage provides South OC car lovers the opportunity to secure their vehicles in an environment made just for them. SoCal's facilities in the lovely city of Laguna Hills feature advanced security systems, white glove service, and a dedicated member's lounge. In addition to storage, our expert sales staff offers consignment services for those looking to sell their cars. For more information, visit us in our Laguna Hills location or at SoCalCarStorage.com, Facebook.com forward slash SoCalCarStorage, or on Instagram at SoCalClassic. And now take it away, Dean. Thanks, Jay. And as my son said, I'm your host, Dean Marash. A very special guest today is Greg Ovis, the CEO and founder of G's Up LLC. Greg and his team at G's Up are focused on locating your dream car and making classic car ownership a reality for their customers. G's Up delivers a full spectrum of automotive services from impartial advice about project vehicles to helping customers complete their build to assisting them in finding their dream car at auctions. He's no slouch fabbing cars either as he's been building some killer show quality rides like the armored truck he is building for the 2021 SEMA. He's also building a full size Chevrolet truck for a new magazine called Truck Hub and he is also building a 2020 Chevy Silverado G's Up Edition for a local dealership in Arizona. He's also sticking his toe in the TV arena as he's filming a pilot entitled, Show Me Some Love. Greg, thanks for joining us on the SoCal Car Scene Podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to be, uh, be chatting with you today. Awesome. Hey, so um, you know what? We're just so excited to have a guest from the coldest place in the country this time of year, Arizona. Never yeah. Know. How hot is it? Well, actually today it's 109, which is actually the hottest of the week so far. It was 94 yesterday, 98 a couple days before. So we're definitely getting back up to the triple digits this week. So, so is 109 okay in Arizona? Is that what they call a dry heat, Greg? Yeah, it's definitely dry heat. 109, once you get 109, 113, to 118, it all just gets becomes a blur after that. So yeah, okay, as long as the, I think. So as long as the sand's not blowing, you're okay. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so hey, let's start by telling telling the audience about your inspiration behind GZEP. What was the biggest influence in this career? And I'm gonna guess it's your father, but give us some background on this uh, story of your incredible uh, business. Um, well, you know, as always, it, you know, with, with guys like myself and like you, you know, it always starts at a young age and, uh, it started, you know, it started young when I was four and five years old with Hot Wheels, you know, red lines, I was collecting them. Didn't even know that they were valuable at the time, but, you know, <laughs> I started collecting them, um, you know, bikes and skateboards, uh, go-karts, you know, so at an early age, I fell in love with automobile and, and cars. Um, one of the things I remember most um, I was probably five or six years old right. and my uncle was building a 32 Ford in his garage and he was uh, doing a, a full custom build and I remember going to his house every Sunday <laughs> with my dad and I would have to sit in the corner in the garage I couldn't touch tools I couldn't touch the car I just had to sit there and watch or go back inside and, you know, eat with the other relatives, which I didn't want to do. <laughs> but my uncle had, was very meticulous. He had all the chrome parts labeled, hanging up on the wall. Everything had its place, very systematic on how he built that car. And I just remember falling in love with the process, the chrome, uh, not to mention obviously the automobile. Um, but those kind of things just kind of, you know, lit a fire in me. And, uh, you know, ever since then, it's been no looking back. And you stepped on the gas pedal. So specifically, how, does the, how do you come up with a name like G's Up? What's it mean? And, you know, what was the origin of that uh, based on all these great car influences you had? Okay, so the, the name G's Up, uh, 
I, I came up with because my first name, Greg, is G-R-E-G-G. -G. So I have three G's in my name, my first name. And my middle name after my dad is Glenn. So I've had four G's in my name, you know, my entire life. And uh, I've always been told that I'm always up and out looking for cars, classic cars, looking for deals, auctions. So a natural thing of, you know, G's up just kind of came to the forefront and decided to go with it. And so far it's uh, proven out to be pretty successful. Well, I love it because it's memorable, but I got to ask you a question. How many people get the spelling right on the first try? Uh, believe it or not, my uh, designer that created the logo and helped me brand everything still gets it wrong. <laughs> he still gives <laughs> me artwork. I'm like, yo, where's the, where's the Z? You forgot the Z or you forgot the E. So uh, a lot of people do misspell it, uh, but once they get used to it, they don't forget it. Well, it's memorable. So that's what's cool. I love it, actually. And, and when I started the company, I, I wanted to come up with uh, some artwork that uh, could not be forgotten. And I don't know if you had a chance to look at the website, but the car. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, the Rolls, the Rolls Royce that I went with and the style and the artwork. Um, you know, once you put your eyes on that car, that artwork, you're not going to forget it. So I think that was a great selection to, to base my brand off of. Yeah, you know, it looks like that. Uh, Bulls is chopped and bagged and slammed and modified and yeah. it's art but uh, it, it's uh, subtle you know so you're wondering exactly what's been done there very yeah actually uh, my friend Nick uh, he has a company called surface Nick art and he's the one that did all the artwork for my for my company and he's he's just an amazing guy to have working with you obviously what he puts together is, is just uh, I, I, I haven't seen anything really surpass the artwork that he puts together for me. Well, it's been a while. It's fun. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Uh, great partnership, sounds like. So, yeah. hey, elephant in the room. We know that COVID-19 pandemic has had an adverse impact on a lot of people in the last few months, and some a lot worse than others. But how about you and your family and your business, everybody holding up? Well, I appreciate you asking. I hope everything's well on your end. Um, family's doing good. Um, you know, we're just going to keep pushing forward. I think this will pass soon enough. Uh, there will be a different norm, I believe, in the car industry and in the car sales industry. Uh, one thing that I've noticed already as far as the auctions, a lot of the auctions that I've uh, partnered up with through the years are now obviously going online. Uh, several auctions have been canceled and, re and postponed to next year. So uh, it's affected a, a part of the business that I wasn't expecting, but it just makes you think of other avenues to succeed. So that's been my goal for the past couple of months is thinking outside the box and pushing forward with a couple of different angles. And I think the word of the week, or at least the last couple of months that I've heard with all business owners and pivot, you know, um, the, you know, the market has changed, the dynamics have changed, whether it's permanent or not is anybody's guess, but you do have to respond and there are opportunities out there as uh, overwhelming as it seems. And so I think the people that are learning to reinvent themselves on the fly are going to prosper. Um, and, and so I think that's true for a restaurant or a car business or whatever business you're in. Yep, I, I completely agree with the word reinvent. Uh, if you're not familiar with that concept, uh, you should look into it because it's just what you have to do nowadays. Right. You just have right. to. So what, so what do you think's next? You brought it up. What's, what's next in the car scene? Do we, do we get back to normal at the end of the year with car shows and auctions coming back online? Or do you think these car shows and these auctions are changing? Muffy Bennett on uh, most recently from the Lake and uh, Richie Brothers auctions. And she was yep. telling us that the online business is doing extremely well. And it could be that, uh, you know, they, they just have a much more amplified online presence but she thinks the auctions are going to be coming back and strong eventually and to some extent they'll be changed but for the most part there's no substitute for face-to-face -face auctions in this car business event. yeah uh, one thing I do know with Richie Brothers and leak auctions um, you know they have their hands in a couple different angles they have classic car they also have you know heavy-duty equipment um, so they have their fingers in a lot of things that's going to give them success over some other auctions but one of the things that I've noticed, uh, you know, the auctions that are face-to-face, -face, 
and you get that excitement level, you have to be there, those are not going to go away. Um, they will come back. They have to. Uh, a lot of people only go to these auctions for that excitement, for that adrenaline that you don't get on TV and you don't get online. So I'm very confident that, you know, Bear Jackson, um, you know, Gooding, Meekum, they're going to keep pushing forward like they always have. Uh, I'm expecting them to regroup a little bit, reinvent them, their processes. But yeah, I, for, I don't see anything necessarily, um, which, what's the right word? Being dissolved. dissolved. Uh, they're going to pick up right where they left off, if not better, as soon as the opportunity allows them. Yeah, and I'm excited to be a part of that. I'm, I, I go to the auctions regularly. I'm here in Scottsdale, Barrett Jackson, all the big ones. I've gone out of state for a couple of them to Vegas. Um, I actually work a concierge service for, for bidders and consigners that really don't want the hype and they right. want an auction representative. So I've stepped in a few times for clients to uh, help them buy or sell a car. So it's going to come back and I can't wait. Awesome. Well, listen, one of the things that we've seen that's different down here in SoCal already is uh, the show scene. I'll let Jason talk about this. Jason, tell us, tell uh, Greg and uh, what's going on with the quarantine crews and how that's kind of blown. Up. But yeah, I'm going to be going to that. Um, I'm going to be going to the quarantine cruise um, this Sunday, which would make that the 14th. So yeah, we're going to start in Huntington Beach around 1030. Um, just got to text the number. Um, I think it's text 2100. Uh, let's see here. I got to go on Instagram. Hold on. That's okay, Jay. But uh, this thing is blown up. It started with just what? Like car again now now where are we at after three or four uh, yeah people have just been dying to go i'm how, how wanting to go to shows and i think it just kind of creates its own thing it's a yes, different, so it's gonna be different like, way of expressing different way of expressing the love of cars something different maybe maybe people are just tired of shows you know maybe people are just tired of walking around and they'd rather participate by actually driving their car so this, you know, this, sh this show uh, is going to be up to almost 2,000 cars if oh, you wow. in Huntington Beach this weekend. The last show was about 1,500. And, oh, wow. Uh, so I got to wonder if there's something new that's coming out of this pandemic. Uh, well, if you want me to reply to that, I think there is. Um, I've noticed here in Arizona there's a couple big shows that have uh, actually turned directions or changed directions. And now it's more of a hangout. Now it's more of a cruise night. Um, right. you, you also don't have guys paying entry fees to enter shows and then maybe possibly be disappointed with trophies or awards. Right. So I think some of these car shows have turned to hangouts and it's brought a lot more people to these events because now it's relaxing, it's more enjoyable. And yeah. at the end of the day, the whole point of having these cars is to drive them. Yeah. So That's a good point. We're, when we're having a cruise night, you know, it's – it's a great thing to have the streets blocked off than in driver cars instead of blocked off and staring at them. Park. I, think, I think the other thing that we've noticed is that you really don't get the car experience as, um, you know, like as not as a, as somebody that's bringing a car, but like, let's say you're in the audience on to see the cars and listen to the cars and have the car drive by you and get the whole experience of the car. Obviously you're not in it, but it's probably a much more enjoyable experience than the static walk by the car at the car show and ooh and ah. Just kind of wonder if we're seeing kind of a, a metamorphosis of the, the car show as a result of this. I don't know. I'm, I'm speculating. Yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not sure either. I think there will be some adjustments, but I'm excited to see what those are going to be. Right. That's for sure. So, hey. Oh, just a little note is, uh, yeah, just making sure that if you, uh, for all of our Southern California, Orange County listeners out there, um, text cr the word CRUISE, C-R-U-I-S-E, to uh, the number 21,000, 21,000. Again, that's CRUISE to 21,000 to meet up with uh, the CRUISE at Huntington Beach. Awesome, Jay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Greg, tell us um, how you and your team at a customer for a specific car. If a customer, my concern always has been, our customers are very particular down here. Uh, 
are people are obsessive compulsive and very detail oriented but how do you deal with super uh specific expectations about quality uh, when sourcing a vehicle for a customer well that's a, that's a very good question it, it takes a, a little finesse um, but first of all you need to find out what the customer wants what are their expectations when they purchase a car are they wanting to relive something from their childhood are they looking to dominate a show scene? Are they looking to have the one-off custom that is on a trailer half the time? So I found out that the first thing is to find out what the customer wants and what, the, what their love and passion is towards the automobile. Uh, some people you know, just want the automobile in their garage and they'll never drive it. They just want to own it and say they have it. Some want to beat it down the road and, and break it in 12 months and rebuild it. So I found that just listening to those customers' uh, thoughts is key. Um, then you find out what level of quality they want for the car. Uh, a daily driver car will not have the same as a pristine show car. And uh, when you find out those dynamics, then I'm able to shop for the car appropriately. Uh, one thing that I've realized is always be upfront and honest. There's right. no reason to waste anyone's time. Um, you know, if a car is not quality, I'm not even going to go look at it for them or represent them as a buyer. I have a term uh, that I use frequently called cosign. So uh, if I'm gonna go to a car and I don't cosign on it, as far as like my opinion, then I move on to the next one. I'm not going to uh, look for a car and spend a lot of energy and pictures and conversations when the, when the quality's not there or the expectations will never be met. So when I go back to a potential client and I say I co-sign off the car it means I think it's great it's meeting all your expectations I think the quality's there the price is there uh, you know let's take it to the next level and uh, you know when you have all those upfront conversations it's very easy to exceed some expectations so I think well, it's not unusual for you to look at um, a, a number no. of dogs before you find the prints no not at all not at all I mean I've looked at you know one one client wanted a 53 Baylor convertible and I mean, I went through probably a dozen cars before we found the one for him. Wow. And uh, the, the, you know, the best part is, is the 12th car, so to speak, was the right deal, the right vehicle for him, even though we looked at a dozen others. So yeah, deal. patience is required as well. <laughs> I bet. For sure. Hey Jake, Greg has us charged up right now. Why don't you tell us about our sponsor and how they keep all of the cars at SoCal Classic Car Storage charged? Oh yeah, for sure. No problem there. Uh, we are uh, glad to uh, tell you a little bit about our friends over at SeaTech. Um, if you're looking for a smarter way to charge your car's battery, our friends at SeaTech lead the way in the care and maintenance of vehicle batteries. In fact, we use them here at the store almost exclusively. Uh, SeaTech's unparalleled knowledge and continuous investment in innovation means they offer high quality, reliable chargers that are effective, easy to use, and most importantly, safe for the user and their car's electric system. The quality of SeaTech's products make them the trusted company of the world's most recognizable car brands, including Audi, Bentley, BMW, Corvette, Ford, Ferrari, Maserati, Mercedes, Porsche, and numerous others. Get yours today at smartercharger.com. S-M-A-R-T-E-R-C-H-A-R-G-E-R.com. Thanks, Jay, and boy, their chargers are the best. I'll tell you what, I remember when we first started this business, you know, there's always a variety of chargers, and I'll, when these came out, I'm like, what in the heck is that? So we're super pumped up to be repping their brand and having them as an integral part of our podcast. Thank you. Greg, back to you. I see that you're building a vehicle for SEMA for 2021, that armored truck. Now, <laughs> the next SEMA vehicle you got going, or are you building something for 2020? Um, I actually, the, the silver, my 2020 Silverado that I just purchased and did the G's Up Edition package on, I'm right. expecting to be at SEMA this year as well. I know SEMA has a few hesitations on putting everything together this year. I do believe they're going to do it, but a lot of the other companies that I deal with are kind of just waiting to get their feet wet and, and you know pull the trigger to go full speed. So I'm, I'm sure my Silverado, uh, my 2020 will be there this year, whether it'll be in uh, cat skin boots, it'll be in MHT wheels. Um, it might have some performance parts on it by then. So I'll have some options for that one this year for sure. So tell us what's unique about that. What is a G-Zip edition other than- uh, 
well, it's that we basically can't just spell. It's, it, you, what it, I'm, I'm looking for, what is the G's Up brand? You know, I, I mean, I've, I've looked on your website and I it's big. You're, you're making changes to stuff that people haven't modified, at least from my perspective. But, you know, that's a very, that's a very uh, you know, my view of what you're doing. But tell us how you want us to think about the brand. Uh, well, the brand is something that's going to is is custom. Um, everything I've ever done or built has never been uh, duplicated to the same level. Uh, whether it's a daily driver car, a full custom build, uh, you know, the vehicle being used for a, a custom build uh, is is one that everyone just walks by. So my brand is the one of ones. I don't want one. I don't want any of my projects or my name to be on any vehicle that's going to get lost in a crowd. And I know a lot of people think that and say that, and they build their trucks and they build their cars. But if you go to uh, a custom car show or SEMA event and your vehicle gets lost in, in, in the dozen of them, then, then I don't think that that vehicle was built um, with the purpose of exceeding or, or being that one of one. Gotcha. So when it came to my, my Silverado, obviously it's a brand new truck and a lot of people can just buy them and put aftermarket stuff, you know, items on them. But on that one, I actually toned it down a little bit because I want people to look at this vehicle and think I can handle this vehicle. I can drive this vehicle. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a thousand horsepower and I don't want to be scared to drive it, but I want that look of something that is customer one of one. So I've actually done this vehicle a little different. I've actually addressed it to the public as being a marketable vehicle for retail market instead of me building it for myself one of one, I don't want anyone to copy me. So I've actually, you know, twisted my own philosophy on this truck and so far I've had great response, great response. So do you think um, there'll be an interest for some of your dealerships um, in, the, in the Chevy family to maybe pick this up and, and do um, like a special edition? Yes. What are your um, thoughts? I already have a relationship with the Chevy dealer, Chevrolet dealer here in Scottsdale. And uh, I actually put this vehicle together with them in mind. So we had several meetings. Um, I actually was going to go with a blue truck uh, at first and then last minute switch it to black. So to answer your question, I do have a, a dealership that's ready to pull the trigger on a few things aftermarket and offer this to the retail uh, consumer. Well, cool. We can't wait to see it, man. Uh, do we yeah, have to I'm, wait, I'm, to, do we have really to wait to or, or can we get a sneak peek before that? Uh, I can shoot you a couple of pictures, get a sneak peek. Um, you know, it's still brand new, so uh, I'm supposed to be uh, delivering it back to the dealership a week from Saturday. So that that's when the excitement will kick in for me. Oh, man, I'm so excited for you. Yeah. Dave, just tell Greg that we're really good at keeping secrets. We always commit to that on this podcast. Our lips yeah, are sure sealed. That. They are <laughs> sealed. He's gone. <laughs> yeah. We, we told one guest that we were going to keep the secret to be shared in that show for about four or five times. I, I wonder if you believed us. I wouldn't oh. believe us. Right? Absolutely. No secrets here. Yeah, I oh, wouldn't cool. believe us at all. So tell us about the armored truck. That's definitely SEMA 2021. Uh, obviously, no risk there. We're pretty confident SEMA is going to happen in 2020, but there's always a possibility. Tell us about that, Bill. Well, that is a bill that I've had on paper. I'd probably say 10 years or more. Mm. I've uh, been searching for armored trucks for a while. Um, and I've been searching for that particular armored truck. Now, a lot of people might not know the difference, but that is an international truck. It's a 95 international 4700 series. It has the Ford 7.3 motor in it. And the reason it, it excites me, because it, it has the slant windshield. Uh, a lot of armored trucks have the flat, 90 degree windshield. This one has slant windshield, so it makes the whole truck look like it's chopped. And I've been trying to get that truck for a long time. And this one gentleman here in Phoenix had a pawn shop, a couple pawn shops out here in the, in the area. And he no would way. have trucks <laughs> wrapped with his marketing information sitting out in front of every one of his pawn shops. So I would drive by and, you know, I'd go in there and visit with them and, hey, is it for sale? No, I'm not selling those things. I'm never selling those things. And so I, I'd say probably through the past eight or nine years, I would check in with him and he just would not sell them. And then I, when I asked him what price would sell it, he'd give me some price, 
you know, 60, 80 grand that, you know, he knows I'll never pay just to shut me up. Um, so after, a, you know, some due diligence through the years with him, um, he had become ill and his family had to take care of him and they had to shut down a couple of the pawn shops. Oh no. And relocate, reorganize. So the manager uh, that had known I was actively interested in him had called me. And I said, yes, I'm still interested in him. He said, well, let's come down and, and talk about him. So I went down there. And the only way for me to get the one that I wanted with the slender windshield is I had to buy all four of them. What? I had to buy all four of them. He's like, I'm not, sell I'm not piecemealing them out. I'm not going to deal with tons of people that want to buy them and don't want to show up and waste my time. So if you want your, the truck that you want, you make me deal on all four of them and you can take them all. Now that definitely was an angle I wasn't anticipating, um, but I went home that night and I understand, you know, I really wanted that truck and I was thinking about it. So I called the next day, which was a Wednesday, went back Thursday morning, offered him a deal on all four trucks and he took the deal. I uh, didn't even negotiate, just accepted my offer, says, get them out of here. And I ended up with four armored trucks <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a weekday. There's not too many um, people that have four armored trucks at any time no, in life. Not to no. mention uh, one day. So so I, was, congrats I was excited, obviously, to, to get the truck that I wanted. But now I had to do, what am I going to do with these other three of them? Like, I mean, just, just towing them is a huge expense. Or moving I was them. Thinking, they're, they're, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even know how to get one home. Yeah, I mean, they're... they're the one that I kept is a 20,000 20, pound vehicle. <laughs> so, and the other ones were 18,000 18, pounds, 19,000 pounds, 21,000 pounds. So, I mean, your flatbeds can't pick that up. Heavy duty has to come get it for you. So I kind of reevaluated the whole situation. I, I, I got some interest on some movie producing, you know, producers that need vehicles for movies. I reached out to some other prop companies on the other three. Um, the following week, I ended up selling the other three overnight. Good. Um, made a ton, of, made some money on them. Oh, good. Plus. Well, and I, I kept the, the international that I have. Well, we can't yeah. wait to see that as it evolves. Uh, you're a brave soul, and I'm glad it worked out for you. Yeah. Uh, would not have their wives or their girlfriends after purchasing four armored vehicles. So, congrats, yeah, right. congratulations on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to have it. So I already um, I uh, bought some 24-inch uh, Alcoa wheels for it that I'm having custom cut. So there would be a one-off pattern in the wheel. Nice. Um, just, you know, since it's a Ford 7.3 engine, it's really easy to go through. Uh, it's diesel, so it's it's not, you know, out of my realm of understanding on the yeah. diesel engine. So it's coming together pretty good. Cool. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, oh. me too. Me too. Uh, yeah, we, we're, we're excited. That's going to be great. So I also noticed when I looked at, you know, at uh, your content on your web and, you know, various places, it looks like you've got a passion for General Lee chargers. Is it those things that influence you as a youth when you're watching the show, building or uh, purchasing or crashing these things? What's going on? I've seen some pictures that you took at a uh, General Lee junkyard, and it's like you were salivating over those puppies. Yeah, um, those aren't my vehicles. I wish I could say that they were. Uh -huh. uh, but that was a junkyard uh, that the gentleman that owned would just, he would be sent these cars after production just to, from, the, from the studios. And at that time, he obviously didn't think the value it might have to keep them, but they just sat in his yard all these years. And to this day, they're still sitting there. They're still People sitting there. Still sitting there. He will not entertain an offer on any of them. And they were they were on the set. The the team. The set. There was a couple uh, comments on my post that they weren't original General Lee cars, but when you really look into them, all the jump packages were built, all the cages were built, all the all the bellies were reinforced. So I'm very confident they were original General Lee movie cars. What a find! Well, someday you know when somebody passes on the next gen, kind of like your armored vehicle. Somebody will return them and there'll be some enthusiasts hopefully puts them back to their glorious self. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're the General Lee and the, and the Dukes of Hazard. I think we all grew up on and loved. We did. Uh, no one can ever say they, they never watched it. 
Jason, you saw that movie, right? Um, did you did you notice the car at all or not? Was were you paying attention to the General Lee in that movie? No. No. What? There was that. The General Lee was in that movie. I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> yeah. It, a lot of the, all a lot I of remember people, is Jessica Simpson. The Daisy Dukes, right? Yes. Oh, that's that's the wrong Dukes of Hazard series. <laughs> <laughs> well, see now, Jason. But a we were. But no, we're talking about the TV show, right? We're not talking about the Johnny Knoxville Jessica Simpson because when you say movie, we're talking about General Lee, the original TV show. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to... Oh, I would say... Go ahead. The, the movie is Jessica Simpson, Johnny Knoxville. The TV right. show is when Luke and, and Boss Hogs, old school. Yeah, Dad, that's more right? your thing. I, that wasn't, I wasn't alive for that. That's, you know what, Jay? Oh, you missed out. No. I you got to make a few of them. Like she, We're old. Yeah, that was that was a pretty good serious acting job on her part you probably got an academy for that hey, i never even saw it <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna admit to ever watching that all movie. right sure you're not all right fine so but you know one of the things that we're also curious about with your background is what what how do you help somebody get prepared to purchase a car at an auction do a number of them and quite frankly um, it's very difficult because I'm used to being able to drive a car when I look go to buy a car I'm used to be able to put it up on a rack take pictures have a video uh, ask you know other pictures look at paperwork so how do you represent somebody uh, like a private party and help them get prepared for that experience because it is a little different than buying from a private party right uh, that's that's a valid uh, question right there. One of the key things is not to buy vehicles at auction, at auction, on an impulse. If you buy vehicles at auction on impulse or adrenaline or emotion, that means you probably didn't take the time to check the VIN, check the quality of the car, check the build, check the history, converse with the with the pre the current owner, uh, get some feedback from the guy that built the car. Um, so the key thing right there is to go into an auction knowing what vehicle you want and what quality level you're expecting. And when you do your due diligence up front, you're able to get that information weeks and months before the auction even starts. So if there's a, a like one of my other clients, he had a, one of the 66 Impala that was going up for an auction last year in Scottsdale. And I mean, a couple months of prep goes into something like that when you're spending money on a nice car. So you can you contact, or can you as a representative of a customer contact the owner before it gets to the auction and, and ask uh, for different information, or how does that work? Well, the way it works, some auctions usually don't give out the current owner's private, you know, contact information, right. but they do provide the VIN number. Um, so you can take that VIN number and you can research it. Uh, some auctions, uh, their consignment managers, those, excuse me, their consignment managers um, can put you in contact with the consigner if you're a serious buyer. Um, they will work those conversations and phone calls for you. Uh, they'll provide you information. They can send you documentation before the auction starts. Oh, okay. They will do that for you. Great. And, you know, it just seems like high quality vehicles go across an auction block, rare. Uh, limited production vehicles, high-end resto mods. Uh, you know, Jason and I, are, Jason showed me a, a collection of must that are going, was that uh, Barrett Jackson or what auction is that, Jay, that those Mustangs are going across? It was Meekum. Yes. Meekum, all the Shelby collection. Yes. And the spring. They had, they had a couple spring more. auctions. Like cars that are one of one, like prototype 350 DTR 1965 Shelby. I mean, just an incredible car. Uh, Paxson supercharger prototypes, one of two. So these cars are incredibly historically significant and rare and valuable. 
And so I think that's kind of what these auctions mean to a lot of people, the opportunity to get close to a historically significant car. And for sure. those, you know, those lucky few, an opportunity to own history. That's a, that's a, that's a great topic. Um, lot, you know, just like the Steve McQueen Mustang that went through Mecham, uh, you know, that just creates such a hype and a buzz. And you're not just buying, you know, a green Mustang. You're buying the historical story behind it. And some people do look at those auctions as those opportunities only, and they thrive on them. Um, so yeah, that's a whole separate angle of buying an auction to get that one of one of one historical vehicle, or you know, some of the everyday guys that just want to add to their current collections. What, what, what's the trend at uh, auction? What are you seeing in for cars that are a little more reasonably priced? Pay fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Are you seeing any trend? Is it, are we getting away from frame off nut and bolt restorations of classic and are we seeing more and more higher end resto mods or what, what's your take? Uh, my take on it right now, the auctions um, that I've been going to and been following, I would say my opinion, one of the popular vehicles that's hitting top dollar at auctions are the K5 Chevy Blazers and the four by four short bed trucks lifted. Those things are just going like hotcakes. Um, a couple builders here in Arizona, a couple builders out of state are doing these frame off builds on these blazers and they're pulling, you know, 150 grand, 180 grand. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're built amazingly, but I'm seeing a trend of those blazers just, you know, going. There's also the, the short bed uh, C10 trucks and you're also getting a lot of the uh, short bed uh, full size Ford trucks from the 60s and 70s. So right now, I think those uh, old school short bed blazer trucks, full size, are just, they're hot right now. You can't touch I, you know, them the, without a grand. Ford, Ford had the Bronco in those same years that they had. Are they quite a bit behind as far as popularity and value? Um, well, when you get into the, the later models, I would say the Bronco's probably trailing the, the Chevy Blazer. But back in the you know, 60s and 70s, um, you know, those Broncos, Blazers, they're all, they're all neck and neck when they're built correctly, when they're built and restored right. Yeah, we, we sold a, um, a real high-end 1974 Bronco here, and it was just incredibly well done, but interest and demand for those, uh, it just seems like, you know, just when you think that market has peaked, it continues right. to trend up. Right. Crazy. Well, thanks for that insight. That's really great. Um, so tell us again, like how do you and your team help not purchase a car per se at an auction? Um, how do you help guide or project manage a customer build? It seems to me, you know, that's one of the hardest things in the world that people want to restore a car. Um, how do you keep that you know, how do you do it without a project manager? If you've never built a car and had a bunch of shops contribute to it, it's got to be the almost impossible to do it yourself without making this thing. Tell us about that. Um, when I've helped customers build cars, uh, it's key to let them know that uh, it's going to take a little bit longer than what they may expect. It's, their budget has to be on point. You don't want to go in there with false expectations. Um, you know, some of these people that want that car really don't have the concept of what it really takes. So you can go to an auction, you can see a car frame off and you love it, but some clients don't understand what it takes to get to that level. So when I do help them, I, I'm, I'm very upfront as far as organization, list, documenting, first and foremost, pick the right car, pick the car you love. Don't second guess yourself and, oh, I don't, I wanted a 61. In Paula, but I'll take the 62. No, if that's yes, what you want, get the 61. Because if you're building that 62 and you want the 61, you're already not happy with it. And then when problems arise during production, then you're not even you're you're worse off. But when you start <laughs> off with a car you love, the labor of love goes a long way. So I direct clients to get the car they love, start off with the right car, right? Even if that means waiting. And then actually after that, after you acquire the car go through the task of making a list and how you want to build it. 
Do you want it built to original specs, tire sizes, color coded, you know, you know, overspray techniques from the factory? Or do you want to chop the roof four inches and tub the back end and get that parameter set? And once you find out that parameter of the customer, then it's just simply just attacking that or, you know, being organized about it, being budget conscious, um, quality expectations. And after that, then it's, then it's kind of fun. You know, you get the car torn down, you update photos, you buy parts, you know, yeah, there's a few things that might change during the process, maybe color change or wheel change, but um, helping someone through that is a great thing because they feel involved. They're actually become educated through the entire process. They, right. they take a lot more pride of ownership of the car because they feel they were hands-on to the best of their ability. And it's, it's created, provided and created a lot of great relationships for me by doing it that way. Awesome. So, you know, I, I was going to take on being a project manager for this truck, one of my customers. And um, I told him, yeah, you know, I think about 75K because we've got a beautiful 1940 Chevrolet truck in here, resto modded in it. It really is an exceptional car. It's done right. And the guy spent about a hundred grand. But unfortunately, the guy that wanted a car done and I was going to project manage, I told him, yeah, I think we can get it for 75000 Then I thought, you know, I better call my paint shop guy and see what he thinks, you know, what it costs. And he says, Dean, it's hard to get anything done for less than a hundred grand. And I, why is that true? What, you, is there a number where, you know, not something done right that, if people don't have enough money, you just say, look, no, you probably shouldn't do this. Or what do you think it's going to take high level? Right. I, I didn't hear that last part. No, I'm just, what's your, what's your guidance as far as how much money it's going to take if somebody wants to do something right and build a car? How much um, money? Well, like I said, that budget's important. As an example, I had a gentleman that had a budget of $60,000 to restore a car with the car price included. That's all he had. Come to find out the car he wanted was a 59 Impala convertible. <laughs> well, right off the bat, <laughs> right off the bat, that budget isn't going to work. You know, you're not picking the right car for your budget. So uh, that's where he actually turned the, turned the tables a little bit. He was thinking of two doors, you know, a couple of hard tops or Bel Airs and not have the rag top. But as I said before, I don't want people to spend money and settle for what they don't really want. So we actually worked with them for another year or so to uh, you know, find a vehicle, a 59 rag uh, within his budget and acquiring the car took him some, took him some, some time to get, uh, but he got the car. So now after he acquired the car, his whole attitude's changed. He's gonna save up some money. He's gonna go through, you know, catalogs and books and figure out how he wants to restore it. But knowing he has the car that he wanted and he actually had to rearrange his budget is a great thing so far. So I'm excited to work with him in the future to put that car together. But to answer your question, you know, budget's key, vehicle's key, and you got to find out what the customer wants before they spend their money to make sure they're happy. So, well, what's the net net of that story? Is he going to get it done for 60 K or was he oh yeah, no, um, I mean, it, it took uh, almost 30, 32K to get the car. Uh, right. But the, the good part about that is we found a quality car. There's no rust in it. It's very complete. It ran and drove. It wasn't sitting in the dirt for 20 years. So uh, he spent a lot of money up front that it's gonna save him a lot in the end. He's, I mean, he doesn't have to hunt down any parts for the car at all. Um, so yeah, it, his budget's going to be reevaluated. I know he's going to, uh, you know, change it up a little bit, but he's getting what he wants, and he's more excited about that and willing to be patient, which is a key thing with these cars. Is patience. patience. It's more than a virtue. It's absolutely essential if you're going to build a car. It's, it's a necessity. You're absolutely right. It has to. It's kind of. It's kind of like working with you, Dad. It requires patience. <laughs> I think it's a necessity, <laughs> and it might be essential. <laughs> Jay. Did you fall in love with that 64 Impala that you sold? I mean, are you an Impala enthusiast? It wasn't here. It wasn't, it wasn't here that long for me to fall in love with it. So that's a good point. Yeah. Like, like the week after I listed it, I remember you got on my butt about that. You're like, Jay, did you list that thing? I'm like, no, dad, I haven't had time. And 
you're like, oh, dude, just list it and it'll sell. Oh, and God. Fair enough. Like within a week, I listed it on Craigslist. It sold. You, you, I don't know if you uh, feel the same way as we do, Greg, but um, when you start talking about purchasing something and your neighbors start telling you about what a great car it is or how want one, you kind of know that it's going to sell fast. And every Impala has that story. It seems like they just. Yep. That's one universal car in the classic world that get out the door quick. <laughs> yeah, the Bel Airs and the Apollos, hotcakes every time. I don't know what Almost it is. Almost any condition, any condition. But uh, yeah, we even, we had a 61 in the back outside and the guy, pretty rusty, kind of, you know, it's a bubble top, I think, and it really has some charm. Yeah, I don't see that. Six cylinder, you know, and I was like, ah, you know, like, yeah, everybody wants this car. And I'm really, you know, because I, I people are so rabid for those, that those years that it just doesn't matter, you know, uh, hey, we'll take it today. <laughs> yeah, the worst part is that 61 Impala is one of my dream cars. I've always wanted the one for myself. Yeah. yeah. And out of all the ones I've had in my life, I've never kept them. I've never kept them. I've always gotten offers and selling them. And Thank I still you. keep myself over a couple of those bubble tops I should have kept. All right. All right. We'll keep our eyes open. This one was white. This one was white with red and white interior. Beautiful color. Just, oh, yeah. just a little advice. Don't fall in love with the cars you sell, although it's hard not to. Yeah. Just don't isn't do it, it to yourself. Isn't it amazing how there's one car that you would, you never thought twice about? Mm -hmm. But then when you see it every day, it's like, now you want one or now you're excited about it. Yeah. It's the craziest thing. Jay, uh, Jay, Jay feels love. that way about that Porsche he just sold. <sighs> Sorry, Jay. I didn't I mean to bring I could have bought a Porsche. I could have pulled the trigger. We sold, a, we sold a 996. And, uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, God, it was only 21000 and I sold it. And after I sold it, I said, "Why didn't I buy that? <laughs> it only had fifty thousand miles on it." Oh, I know. We so we got we got some really good advice, Greg, from Muffy Bennett. You know. Oh yeah. And she said, "I used to fall in love." She said, um, "I was notorious at the end of auctions for crying when a car that I bid on I didn't get, and it was another owner." She said it was so emotional, but. She, I think she got some sage advice from one of her mentors. Like Jason said, you gotta stop falling in love with the cars that you're selling. You have to. Yeah, and it's so hard too, it's terrible. <laughs> you know, you, you see, you know, for me, you know, I'm always looking and I see all these cars up for sale or auctions or, yeah. or available through private sale. And it's like, you know, I look at one car and before you know it, I haven't even bought the car and I'm already looking for like wheels, then I'm Googling the car, you know, retro, you know, resto mod of that car. Then I'm looking for class. Then before you know it, I have like 10, 20 pictures in my phone and I have never even, you know, touched the car in person, but I'm already excited about it. It's, it's a terrible thing. It's a disease. It's a disease. I, the one I fell in love with, I have to say that I sold was a 1985 Nomad. It had, um, it was a, a yellow and a cream on the outside, two-tone, but Great it had car. the, it had a mint, um, and ivory interior, so green and white on the inside, yellow and white on the outside. Unusual, but boy, it just worked. And talk about an incredible restoration. Our always started right up, and it felt like factory fresh. Like, yeah. like this is what it must have felt like when you picked one of these things up. And it's the easiest car to drive. You get that thing, you're like, this is like butter. Like, yeah. So oh, I don't know the the fifties and sixties cars when when correctly take you right back and you're just you know you're in love with an era or something I'm not sure what's happening. It's that era of cars for sure. So, Greg, I, you know I want we're going to be closing in a few minutes, but I uh, I did notice that you're going a little Hollywood on us, which you know, <laughs> uh, you, they may have put a pause on that. But tell us about this pilot that you're filming for TV. Uh, is that something you can talk about us or is that a, talk to us about or is that super secret? Yeah, I can, I can share some of it. Um, okay. 
I was, uh, I've, I've been trying to get into uh, the TV show arena for several years right now. So uh, I was um, coming up with some ideas. I pitched a couple ideas a few years ago that uh, the networks thought was too extreme. And uh, I can share that one with you. What my first concept was is to have a show on TV that uh, the viewers pick. So as an example, if you take, say, Dancing with the Stars slash Automotive, yeah. now the audience is picking what kind of car to build. The next week, the audience is picking what color it is. Then the audience is vote, calling in to vote on what engine to put in. So I had a whole hold to do with that pilot. But every network thought that was just way too consuming. They all loved it. They're like, we can't, you know, this is just blows our budget right off the bat. So uh, yeah, I went back to the drawing board, but the, the concept I have now that I've already submitted, um, it's a warm and fuzzy feeling kind of show. Um, it helps the guys that are building their cars in their garage. Um, it's helping the guys that don't have a hundred grand. And it's helping the guys that don't have a shop full of 10 guys. And it's for the guys that have that car in their garage that they love but they don't have the funds or the, or the, or the backup to build it or to finish it. You know, some of the guys I've met, they have, you know, these rare cars in their garage, but since they don't have the opportunities to build them overnight, so to speak, they have to go to swap meets. They have to get those $20 parts. They have to check eBay for that fender. So the whole show and the premise of that show is helping those guys out. And uh, it, it's come together very nice. The show is called show it some love meaning it, nice. you know, as your, as your car. And uh, I've already had a lot of sponsorships on board. I have a lot of backup from some companies that want to provide products. So uh, I'm excited to hear back. I submitted it uh, back in March to several production companies um, that asked me to come up with a concept. So they were excited to receive it, but with the uh, COVID going on, a lot of the production, a lot of the pilots have been put on hold. Sure. I've been told that a lot of the uh, shows that are running now are just going to do a lot of reruns and repeats for the rest of the year. Yep. So you won't see a lot of new episodes with new uh, talent. So I'll be patient. You know, car guys are patient. So I'm going to keep filming it and keep submitting it. And hopefully first next year we can reevaluate the uh, show submissions and TV show outlooks. That's great. We look forward to your success, sir. It sounds like a lot of fun. Congratulations. Just Thank you. Point. Thank and you. as Jason will tell you, We've got a lot of candidate cars for you. So if you need some of those, uh, you know, uh, that's the majority of my car collection, right, Jay? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it is your car collection, not the majority. Ouch. <laughs> Greg, that really hurt. But I'm, I'm used to it. I'll, I got to own it, though, Greg. You have to. I have to. You have to own it. You could be owning a lot of other worse things. Right? <laughs> yeah, I've got a few classics that run, but you don't want to take them too far. You know, they, their, their typical MO is marginal brakes, systems, and occasional breakdowns. But you bother an old car guy like me. That's how it was going back and forth to school every day. You know, you'd collect money, you know, a quarter or two from your friends to get to school. You kind of shake them down get to the gas station, you keep the extra money. And then they didn't realize this. We'd break down halfway to school. Well, I never gave them their money back. You know, right. they had to walk the half the way. And it, it was, you know, hey, what? Guess what? I was driving, you weren't. You, you know, it became my new normal. So I'm with it. I'm, I embrace it. <laughs> I remember, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, my grandpa had a 66 Impala that he bought brand new. And it was still original condition. Like it still looked brand new even in the seventies, but there's still nothing better when it breaks down and, and you get out and you bang the starter a couple of times and you jump back in it. <laughs> you know, it's not, nothing more fun than that. Or, you know, it overheats a little bit and you got to put some water in it outside the road and hang out mm -hmm. a few minutes, look cool. Jump Can back you imagine? Home. Can you imagine today's man break down on the side of the road? I think they'd all cry, you know, yeah. crying out loud. Yeah. No more toolboxes in the trunk and a, a cord nope. on a transmission fluid. Those days are gone, thank God. They're gone. A lot of these, a lot of these 
I'm going to say kids today don't even understand the floor jack, the jack that comes in the car. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about those. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't know where to put that, right? Even though. Uh, hilarious. Well, listen, a big thank you to you, Greg, for joining us today. That was a great ride. We, I just can't tell you how much fun it is to unpack your success story, the whole story of G's Up, and the, the future it looks really bright for your, your business and uh, all that you're doing. So congrats on that. Yeah, and thanks for having me. What a great opportunity to chat with you guys today. It's been great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you uh, can you tell um, you know people how to find you uh, you know out there on social media land or or follow your business? Absolutely. Um, I, my website is gzup.com, which is g e e z z u p dot com. You can't miss the the blue and silver rolls. And uh, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Twitter, all under the same logo, G's Up. And I'm just starting a, uh, well, actually, as soon as I'm just starting, I do have a G's Up YouTube page, but I'm just starting probably in a couple of weeks to start putting the show episodes on it. So my YouTube page has been kind of quiet on purpose because I want to just blow it up in a month. So feel free to go to G's Up on YouTube and see some great content coming soon. Right on. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you out there for uh, joining us today on the SoCal Car Scene Podcast. To find this and other episodes, please go to all your favorite podcast platforms like Apple, uh, Stitcher, Buzzsprout, Google Play, uh, and also on Spotify, where the Joe Rogan podcast is now. So uh, go there as well. Um, or you can go to the SoCal Classic Car Storage Media page. That is the link of SoCal, Cla SoCal Car Storage forward slash media. And all of our episodes will be on YouTube in the near future. Um, so all you got to do is look up the SoCal Car Scene. So and Cal are two separate words, so don't combine them or else you won't find it. And you can see videos of all of our incredible guests and uh, our handsome faces as well. So please listen, watch, subscribe, and follow uh, for all of us here at the SoCal Car Scene, including Dean Marash, an owner of SoCal Classic Car Storage. We say goodbye and happy driving.